Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, first off, before we get started uh, recapping, just wanted to see if there are any questions or comments um, or any, anything anyone has from, uh, from last weekend or Monday. This is Ramel. I do have a question. Last sure. week we ended with talking about um, being creative, but I like an explanation of the difference between being the creative and not shaping. Okay. So when we uh, when we when we think about being uh, creative or creating. We look at um, from the standpoint that we create every day with our thoughts and our um, things that we bring into being with our thoughts, and 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 they come become reality for us. For instance, uh, creating you're you're doing more of the environment around you, from where you're pulling things from inside, and you're actually. Uh, for instance, if there is a, a need for 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 love and kindness, for instance, to be shown, you're demonstrating that by what you're bringing forward, whether that be showing compassion to someone, um, actually doing something that uh, would impact their lives. For instance, if you start a food drive, um, that's something you created and you brought to life in the attempt to help and you know, bring love and kindness with no sort of um, motivation for you to gain from it. When we uh, when we look at shaping, and you saying the same thing that uh, you want to bring forward love and kindness, but you're trying to uh, control the results of it. And so, in other words, if you're uh, doing that same food bank or food drive. Well, you try to control who benefits from it, or you try to steer it in a certain direction. You want it to only benefit the people, say on on Elm Street, but the folks on on Washington Avenue, you don't want them involved because you feel like it's not going to help them. So you try to can the shaping is when we try to control the results of things, and we try to dictate uh, how it looks or or how we structure it, where with uh, being creative, we're bringing forth the actual concept of just love and kindness, and, and, and we're willing to share that experience, where with the shaping of it, um, you're trying to control the results and the direction that it's going to go and, and so put some sort of structure around it that wasn't necessarily intended from the beginning, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you very much. Uh, no, you're welcome. Uh, any anyone else? Yes. I have. In this, in this, hey, ST. Okay. Good morning. Hey. I have a quick question um, because I was just thinking about this the other day, and um, I know we said um, we should do what we need to do and you know meditate pray whatever um but do you remember that verse in the bible that says bad company corrupts good character so how do we how do we get around that i mean i know there's also a scripture that says to guard your heart and all that but if it defended if it definitively says bad company corrupts good character, how does anybody um, keep themselves from being corrupted? I mean, you no, can stay sorry. away from the you can stay away from bad company, but you can't always do it. No, and, and, and I was trying to think of the verse, but you know we, uh, and that's that's true because in order for us to function, we're still surrounded by a certain amount of chaos and dysfunction, and and 
I do think, though, it, it goes back to, uh, you know, understanding who we are and having a certain amount of clarity about it. And I think with the meditation gives us clarity and it, it kind of validates what we are. And just like being in the, we talked about being in the religious setting or the church setting, how the environment can kind of shape you to where you're doing certain things you think are good, but they're not necessarily the righteous flowing things. And so I think we have a, a responsibility to ourselves to always give us that clarity and identity one. And then also when we're in the midst of that, we still have that clarity. For instance, if, um, you know, and, and this is a perfect example because this, this happens all the time. You take kids at school and they have, um, they have the best intentions of going through graduating. Hey, I want to do something with a college. And then they are around other kids too that, are, that sort of had that same intention. But in one case, well, hey, you know, uh, let's start vaping. Let's start doing this. And this is the, the group that, you, that they're in. And you actually restrict the kids um, shaving by saying, oh, you can't hang out with those guys or you have to stay away from them. And you're talking to a teenager and you say, well, you know, that's just not, you know, where you want to be. And that's, um, that's, I guess I see that as sort of a ba- uh, bad intention or that's kind of like uh, changing his environment. But at some point, in order to to step beyond that, that individual still has to fight that off, understand, okay, I'm a, this is my identity. Yes, I'm I'm getting exposed and pressure from it, but it's, it goes back to the inner clarity of where am I going to start fighting it? Is it a daily battle? Is it a, is it hurting my growth? And I think we have to do it from a growth standpoint because, you know, the reality is none of us are ever perfect or intended to go through life without making errors. But when we, um, we look back at the core of things, we have to maintain that, that, that identity and that, that path that we're on. And sometimes, whether it be recovery, taking steps back, we have to do things to help us grow. And I think that's really an opportunity for for growth when we make errors. And I don't think we're going to go through life without making mistakes or having things put on us. But I think at the core, we can't let something externally influence how we view ourselves. Um, and that's that's a kind of a tricky question because we all, especially at, you know, at a, you know, I'm just trying to use it to an immature standpoint. We all have been immature or um, unwilling to take a certain step or accept that status that goes back to denying that status. We've all done that, but at some point, the recovery from that has to be uh, us being cognizant of who we are and growing forward. I, I don't think uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but I don't think that like when we compare it to the philosophy, for example, where someone's going through life under that incorrect philosophy that we say it's going to meet their end or death, um, and that's the thing that we have to avoid. Like we have to make sure that we have true clarity at the core that I'm clear about what's what, and then. Going back to what we said several weeks ago, we had to continue to kind of feed ourselves and feed feed ourselves spiritually, so that when you do meditate, you have the you, you get the clarity out of it, even if it's five or ten minutes. I, I I don't know if I can go beyond five minutes, for instance. Um, but it's just at that point you you try to just get the clarity to align the thoughts and to align. Of the process up for us to kind of function and be function instead of that dysfunction that we talked about. Does does that make sense to help a little bit? I know I ramble a little bit on that. Yeah, 
I mean, it does, but I was just thinking about that in terms of um, how the how the Trump people who all claim to be so Christian, blah, blah, blah. And what the Bible does tells me us, oh, the very elect can be fooled too. Yeah. So yeah, it's a tough I, thing. I saw one of those stickers the other day too. Uh, says, Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. <laughs> and, and that goes back to the whole, uh, the Jesus is my savior thing, like, that's a hard one to get beyond because we always have been taught that grounded that if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're not a Christian. Or if you don't believe Jesus, you know, as your Lord and savior, but you know, what we've been understanding and learning the last several years that, that Jesus did make the sacrifice for us, but we also, um, we share in that every day. And so it's more metaphorically in the sense that uh, the doctor, Dying to self, we we understand now that we're Elohim, and uh, and that's a big hurdle to like remove from someone because it's easy to put your your burdens on a third party person or or another entity besides yourself. It's easy to say, well, okay, uh, you know, God's going to do this for me. God wanted Trump to be president, and you know, He wanted all these policies in place. So religion. And not spirituality kind of um, cripples people. It kind of holds them hostage. They and they remain. Those are people that remain stuck because they don't ever take any kind of responsibility for themselves. And one of the things I saw this week that mankind has always been in search of the eighth sense, and they've always done it through chemicals. And so, and that was one thing I was going to bring up today that we've been trying to do that through. Uh, through chemicals to reach there. And so someone who's in that state of mind, that's that's a perfect example of someone who's stuck and also following a philosophy that will end in death. I guess the answer is that you really have to realize who you are. And and if you don't, uh, you can be carried away by. Yeah. Did you speak a little bit? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. I, I could you repeat that. Uh, someone was speaking, but you, you were kind of like you were really far away from the phone. Sorry, I said I guess the answer is you really have to realize who you are. Um, otherwise, you can be carried away by corrupt people. Yeah. It, you know, remember, we, uh, I think someone talked about, uh, I think Evelyn asked a question about the uh, the African culture, and uh, we talked about the uh, the assimilation, how, you know, you look around this country and everyone's sort of assimilated, and that's what the culture, the environment around us wants us to do. They want us to assimilate and just take part into it so that we get integrated smoothly into the religion and not necessarily... Uh, at a point where we're thinking for ourselves, we're answering our own question. LeBron gave an answer last week about this, this, this passionate question, but in explaining it, he sort of answered it for, him, for himself too. And so religion doesn't allow us to talk through things like that. It only wants us to assimilate because, or the group, the same thing with the group, because the appearance of the group is more important than the people who are in it. And and when we kind of assimilate to uh, a certain church or that's why it's always so much, it seems like it's always so much branding and marketing. Like, uh, like these people wear a t-shirt that says, uh, I love my church, the name of the church in the back or whatever. And that's fine if you love your church, but there's so much um, branding and marketing to like, to force people to assimilate or to choose a set, choose a group. And, we get all these uh, pressures and influence from, from, you know, from life every day. And no one ever tells you to, to, to meditate and align yourself uh, internally. It's always, Hey, do you want to belong to this club? Do you want to participate in this? You get friends that says, Hey, well, we're all going to do this. Come on. You don't really feel like going, but you go because it's your group. And, uh, and I guess you know, we got to balance that social social uh, mentality and doing things, but 
always remember that um, we're not in the group, we're not in the church unless we're all, you know, in that same mindset of we're Elohim. But if, and then you're, it's so much easier, like Pastor, a couple of weeks ago, that we help each other because we understand who we are and, and we all kind of have the same mentality. But for someone who doesn't, was where we have to kind of like balance and meet because you, you don't want to be a turnoff to anyone either. But at the same time, for all these years, people have been forced to assimilate and, and join a certain area. And then they're like, okay, I'm not getting the answers there. So I need to find out, you know, because we all have that urge to kind of go back to the beginning and follow the breadcrumbs. So someone who wants to stay in that setting, but they still want to find out who they are without leaving that setting, they do things like um, like readings or um, shrooms. And, and I'm going to the extremes now to try and find out who they are. Yeah, but they never, um, been, you know, at least in, in my traditional setting, there was never any talk about meditating. But, you know, in a way, they they had a sense about it because they used to talk about going into your closet and praying. It just wasn't a lot of details around that. You know, they would say, go into your dark room and just pray. And, and so now we understand that, no, uh, instead of trying to send things outward, let's pull it from inside and, and sit down and meditate and organize and breathe and think. We talked about the visualization aspect of a little bit of Monday, how we can kind of like, um, and that was, I think, going back to the first question about shaping and creating. And um, we go back to the visualization of seeing yourself being able to accomplish or doing something. And we taught Monday, really, what we're creating is we're creating that, that space, the opportunity for you to do it. And and that's always key too when we're talking about um, fighting against certain things. We always have to you know leave us room to to create and always be creative in that situation because that will that will trump anyone trying to um, take you down or put you in a um, compromising situation if we're always in a, a sense to we're clear of what we're clear. We're always trying to create our own opportunity and space for us to be ourselves. And it doesn't mean that we got to, you know, you with a group of people and they're like, hey, we want to we wanna go in here. And, well, I'm Elohim, you know. So it just means that we're always creating an opportunity for ourselves to be uh, who we are. And, and that in the self, your actions and character and how you carry yourself, people gravitate to that as well. And they know that, hey, you know, I can remember being in high school and and there were certain things that would go down. People knew not to include me because I probably wasn't going to do it. I didn't have a sense of uh, of who I was then as far as Elohim. I just stayed, you know, I was probably just security cat to them. So, but it was always like people feel your aura. They uh, they sense things around. And we didn't talk about aura a lot last week, but they know, you know, that they can sense what they, you know what. And that's why they come to you. That's why they approach you about problems that they have sometimes. So it's just a, it's a balance that we always have to walk because um, we always have to meet people where they are. And if you're ever going to help another individual become more aware of their true identity, you still have to understand and evaluate where they're at at that point and not judge and not um, try to shape them merely exposed to them who they are. And any questions or comments on that? Yes, this is Barbara. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, Audrey's question comes from 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty-three. Uh, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. So to add to everything that you've said about vain philosophies, et cetera, et cetera, that's what it's talking about. You're right. Um, and, and, and this is talking about those who question resurrection and, 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 what it, and, and as you say, the issue is uh, d- don't stay in the company of those who don't believe um, 
what you believe because you will hear them continuously. And that's what, what you, you will, your soul will be hearing that continuously. And, and so I think you said you, you have to choose to stay close to, to uh, the thoughts of Elohim. And so when you know things are not uh, as you think they are, the question is not staying there just to quote unquote convert somebody uh, because there are people who just simply will not listen, will not hear. And so if you stay in an environment, and, and it could be even a church, if you stay in a church where the truth is not coming forth, they're not telling you who you are, et cetera, what your purpose, your true purpose is, uh, that, that's part of what it's talking about. Be not deceived. Um, evil communication corrupts good manners, that you could uh, allow that to get into you, into your spirit, and um, you begin to act the way um, they do. You begin to talk the way they do. And so that, that's sort of what it's talking about. Don't, don't keep yourself in that kind of environment, as you said. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Barbara. And, and that just, you know, just added a little more clarity for me in there. Because, you know, mankind, we, we get glimpses of certain things, um, even in, in our working environment. Because somebody went somewhere and they, they read a motivational book by someone who wrote it and who had some decent and good nuggets in that book. If you look at uh, if you look at corporations, hospitals, if you just look at employers all over the country now, there's a shift to where they put a heavy emphasis on work culture. What's the culture like at work? And and a lot of that times these cultures are. Uh, being created now because Barbara Emma may have been on a, a job and you and you and you were a valued um, asset to that company because of just everything you brought to the table. Well, you leave, and they're like, "Well, Barbara left because why?" You know, they find you were frustrated, and they're like, "Well, what frustrated you?" You, you begin to say things and tell them in the, in the exit interview that affected your decision because the work culture wasn't there. Um, morale, whatever was going on. And so now they take this feedback from losing good people, you know, because in a sense, you know, I was always telling the company, I don't care if you leave or go, in a sense, production. That used to be the mentality. It's like, well, you can stay or go, but we're going to keep rolling. But well, now when they lose good people, it's sort of like, okay, we can't continue to do that because we're losing experience, we're losing value. And so they're putting a heavy emphasis now on on a work culture, um, you know, getting rid of kind of the bad eggs, um, what can they do to make things better in that working environment? Because they feel like production and morale will be better if we create a better culture here at work. So I kind of tie that to, um, to Audrey's question too and some things like that. Sometimes it's uh, the message is stronger when someone who is truly valued leaves a situation and they're like, well, why did she leave? What, why did she go away? And so I sort of equate that to it as well, because we are now living in a time where everyone, whether it be in a religious setting or spiritual setting, they're trying to figure out answers. They're trying to make things uh, better culturally in their situation. And so there, there is a little more of a, asking uh, questions of the people involved to see if they can improve things or or just to take the temperature of how people feel about what's going on. And so when you look at it from that standpoint, that is sort of a, a touch or, or getting to an approach of where we are right now, talking about this in a sense and, and creating, you know, you have people now are trying to create, they're trying to, bring a process in that uh, that hasn't been into existence in their company, for instance. So when we look at the macro and the big picture of it, some of these things are happening now in, in every aspect of our lives, whether it be work, professional, home. Here, you're starting to see a lot of these things kind of cross over. So that is an influence that's coming from somewhere. I have a question. 
Sure. Okay. Um, you were talking about how we are changing things. I have a question as far as what is it that we're doing, the people that pass the covers and to check, well, no, let me just say this. You were talking earlier about how these agencies are losing good people, but if for some reason, instead of them getting rid of those who cause these people to leave, like the overseers, the mentality that these black overseers have, they keep them in place. And it's like they're not trying to do anything about it. They're trying to preserve what was already there, if that makes sense, what I'm saying. So what is it that we're doing to change that? I, I think we're, you know, just by what we're putting out in the macro, because there used to be the term, uh, each one teach one. Well, now that you teach that one, that one teaching someone else. So. When we, and this thing about yourself, and I can think about myself too, when, when you go to work, for instance, I'm just using work because we spend a lot of time there during the week. You treat people a certain way and that's, that's, that's noticed. Now, where we work, we have to work within the, you know, the structure of that company, you know, it depends on what you're doing, but we're all having to work within the structure of the company to get the, the daily task at hand done. But from a, a mentality standpoint, people watch how you treat other people and for so long, and it's not perfect by any means right now, but for so long, companies did not care how you felt <laughs> about work. They just wanted you to come in and do your job. But when they start measuring production, they start doing these surveys, they start talking to their own customers how service is when their customers call and interact, all these things they, they get measured on and maybe their motivation is, hey, we don't want to lose money or we don't want to operate inefficiently, but they are, there's a shift really. I mean, even when you're talking about uh, diversity now, like I, we do, uh, we're required to do diversity training every three months, I think it pops up on a computer just to remind you that, hey, this is the kind of culture we're trying to create. And it doesn't mean that the motivation could be, hey, I don't want to get sued or have a, a lawsuit or whatever. But at the same time, that message is still going through. And I've noticed where in the last couple of years, it's shifted from the discrimination or racism more and it's becoming a more inclusive environment. That's the term we use now. We want to be more inclusive with everyone's beliefs and their sensitivity. And so it's, it's shifted from racism and discrimination to being more inclusive. So it's just the culture that you work in. You can walk into the office and you can sense that this, this is a toxic environment. And like you said, there's always one or two bad apples that are present that they're making it toxic because of their presence and how they want to do things and wielding the authority that they have. But I think that's slowly changing and these people are, are being forced to adapt as well because it, influ it, it you know it affects their work, their pay, their work-life balance. And so it, it's, it's really, there's a shift going on and for like you may have a lot of the rotten apples there but a lot of people are being called on the carpet to you or being asked to change how they manage people and how they um, interact with their coworkers. So I, so I hope that helps our answers. Good morning, everyone. Um, to add to the question that was asked about um, bad company of how it can impact a good person, um, as long as you never share an experience with the bad company or whatever you call is bad, you will be fine. And what I mean by that is from my personal experience, I have some family members that use drugs, every kind of drug. I can hang out with them because I'm not going to share an experience with them. And on the other hand of that, I have some cousins 
that sell drugs to their own cousins. Now, I don't hang out with them. If I go up to their city, um, hey, little George, you know you can use the car. I'm not using the car. Or if I'm at a place where my money is no good and I can get something just I don't do it because I don't want to share an experience with them. So if you're around negative people, and I'm around negative people all the time, people that are poor in spirit, that kind of negativity, as long as I don't share an experience with them, I'll be fine. So if you're the good person and you have some negativity around you, um, on your job site, in your family, in your community, in your organization, just don't share an experience with them. Um, to stay in my family, when I go well, out excuse, with my cousin, <laughs> Joe, excuse me, what do you mean don't share an experience with them? Um, oh, uh, share an experience with them. Like my cousins who sell drugs, when they, if they say, hey, little George, you can use my car whenever you come up here, I'm not going to use their car because that's an experience. Because um, friendship is really about an experience you have, sharing an experience with them. And, and the Rev, I hope I explain that the best that I could explain, but I just feel like when I'm around people who are negative, just don't share that experience. I, I'm not going to be an individual that says, don't nobody talk like that. I feel that's very negative. I would say, I don't know of another person that would think like that. I'm not going to share that experience. Um, so I hope that answers you, your question, Reverend Richard. What I'm hearing, would it be with the best said if you say don't engage in in the in their host to what you're saying, because using a car, not sharing an experience. The reason you don't use the car is because you don't know what's in it. You just don't engage with them and what they do. Would that be a um, better way or different way of putting it? You know, and, and Reb, I would have to agree with that. I think that's the best way uh, to put it. Don't engage. Um, don't engage. Well, I don't really know if that's a really... I can live with that, though, Reb. I can live with that. Or Thank be aware. So, oh, I was gonna say, oh, okay. you can go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you know, two things. You're not, doing. you're not denying your true character and identity, who you are. You're, you're just being, you're being yourself. One, another thing is that you're, you know, you're fully aware of what's what's going on around you, and so being, a, you know, having that awareness is no more than that. That 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 seventh sense where it's the you you understand your surrounding and, and how you know how things are being balanced around you so you're aware of what's going on around you and you're still not denying the true you know true nature of who you are because you can still be you know kind and just to someone and not participate in whatever activity activities they got going on and and they still can see that that part of you and, but you know, and you're also aware of, of who you are to them. So, uh, and, and that's a perfect situation where you're not there to look down on anyone. You're not there to uh, promote any kind of status. But as long as you don't deny the true identity of who you are, and, and, and just be aware of of what's going on around you. Oh, go ahead, Sheldon. I'm sorry. No, uh, not a problem at all. Um, the the Aramaic version of that uh, verse is a little bit broader, but at the same time, a little bit more intentional at the same time. Um, it reads, don't be deceived. And then in quotes, evil expositions corrupt pleasant minds. And 
this is talking not so much as uh, physical things, but more so along the lines of uh, intentions um, of individual or just the intentions of ideas and thoughts in general. And therefore those things that are, that here are deemed evil or more so those things that have uh, in a sense, any viewpoint, uh, intention, uh, origin uh, from that, that for example is uh, selfish and uh, greedy or just looking out for a self, uh, something that is willing to harm, uh, uh, something that is willing to deceive, uh, take advantage, all those types of things uh, would be considered as uh, evil. And so uh, those uh, ideas or uh, viewpoints or anything that is rooted in that, uh, then it goes on, corrupts uh, pleasant minds. And here, pleasant minds are, are more akin to that which we talk about essentially every time uh, we meet, which is uh, that of the creator, that of our higher selves, that of us being more uh, connected, uh, open, um, uh, things of that, uh, that nature, um, those things uh, who and what uh, we really are. So those evil uh, uh, expositions, excuse me, that I just mentioned are coming from more so a place of lack, a place of being cut off, and then essentially coming from a standpoint of thinking that it has to be, uh, is on God. And what I mean by is on God is, I must create everything for myself because if I do not create everything for myself, then I will not survive or I will uh, uh, surely uh, essentially pass away. And so that's where the disconnection comes from uh, with this supposed, uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, evilness. So in, in that way, it's not just talking about individuals. Uh, like I said, it's talking about the ideas that are entertained, not necessarily being someone, but buying into uh, anything, no matter where it comes from, even within ourselves, of that, like I said, that place of lack of evil intentions. And, and uh, one last thing. For example, when I said even within ourselves, if I myself were to buy into an idea of lack and meditate or ruminate uh, on that particular uh, thing within my, uh, you know, here myself uh, as being cause of self sheldon I will become uh, disconnected myself and my mind, uh, if I am a, a good state, a pleasant mind of being connected, will then start to become uh, corroded um, and I will build upon those evil thoughts and ideas within myself uh, as well. I'm finished. Everyone there? Yeah, yeah. I, I oh, okay. <laughs> Given the strategic pause, be I don't know if someone is ready to say something else or not. Um, hey, is this Ron? Um, hey, Ron. Good morning, y'all. I, I I wanted to go back and and look at something else that uh, caught my attention when the male asked about shaping. Uh, I, I guess that's kind of been something I've been thinking about all week because we we kind of touched on it Monday night a little bit. Uh, I was looking at something here when it when you look at uh, being complete or being whole, it talks about holiness and all of those things talk about creating space. Creating space. So can it be that as creators what we create is space and what we intend to fill it with is based on what the universe says it looks like. For example, if if my desire is love and peace and forgiveness, there is no picture of that 
anywhere for me except to see it exemplified in another person. But if I pray for that, if I make space for that, uh, I'm not sure it's going to look like anything that resembles what I've already seen. So if I try to shape that, if I think I know what that looks like, does that not fill the place that the universe is supposed to fill? Uh, does, am I making room then for something to be created? Because I have created the space, but I'm also filling it. So, well, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, and I'm just kind of speak, talking this out because one of the things I'm looking at my notes, one of the things we, we talked about uh, a while back was even tithing. Tithing is a way of creating space, uh, opening something up and creating space in a, in, in a spiritual sense, uh, uh, readying you to receive something. And I think too often maybe we try to look at what that something is or you know we 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 see a void in the earth of something that needs doing and we want to fill it the way it looks to us but if we are creating uh the, 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 um, again going back to genesis when it says the earth was uh shapeless it's easy to un try to understand what that means and want to shape it but is that not is that kind of counterproductive if 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 i do that if i create that space if i create that opportunity uh isn't that it is you know it, it am i one with the universe if i am also the one that tries to fill it is what i'm getting at yeah, well, I'm. I'm oh. Well, um, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say that the, you know when we start desiring, you know, whatever you desire, is you're creating the space. When, for instance, when, when Kathy talked about the laws of attraction, and we talked about the, we had that lesson on laws of attraction, and so when, for instance, if you desire to be a more patient individual, if I desire to be a more patient individual. When I'm opening up and I'm the des I'm desiring that, then more opportunity is going to come for me to learn and to exhibit patience. Me shaping that would be like I only want to learn to be patient on Mondays and Tuesdays. The other five days, you know, I don't I don't I don't want to do it. I don't want to have time for that. Cause, so we try to you know we try to shape to put in a certain structure. But the reality is if I'm desiring for more opportunities to be patient, those opportunities are going to come, and I can't really shape how they approach me. It's just going to be uh, brought to me, and how am I going to handle it? How am I going to react is where the lesson of being more patient happens. And, and you know, you've kind of you've created that, uh, that lesson for more patience from within yourself, but... You can't shape it and say, well, I only want to take the class on Mondays and Tuesdays. You know, that part of it, it won't necessarily work that way. Or or you can't also say that, you know, I want to be more patient in two within two weeks. You you can't put a time frame on it. We just have to bring the opportunity to the desired opportunity to come to us. And in that desire, the only result you want of that is that we want it to elevate our, our awareness of who we are and, and help us understand that we are more patient at the end of that journey, but we can't shape it of how long and when and, and what it comes to us as. Ron, I was uh, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I was uh, thinking about uh, what you just uh, said earlier, but I could not respond at the, uh, at the time. And uh, as S uh, said, uh, we're all well. First, we're always creating, regardless. We have uh, created uh, since we've been in this uh, realm. Uh, we create our environment and everything around us. Let, let me start off there and say that. Um, 
and we create through uh, our uh, desires, our thoughts, beliefs, uh, et cetera. Um, th the difference in creating through uh, just desire um, and uh, letting it, uh, creating that space and letting whatever happens develop from uh, all that exists. And the difference between shaping is once we are actually shaping, uh, though we're not thinking about it uh, in this way many times, we're also doubting. And how we're actually uh, doubting or coming from more so of a limited standpoint is like we have a desire, yes, that may be uh, quote unquote a righteous uh, a desire. However, in the shaping comes where we're having a uh, little faith or feeling as though we have to do it ourselves or it has to be uh, come about in this particular way. And how that is limited faith is because in a limited type of way, that in a sense is how we believe that desire must come uh, to reality, how that desire must manifest uh, itself. And so that is the way that we actually are uh, limited because in creation, there are infinite uh, possibilities. We have chosen a, uh, out of all those possibilities, a singular way or a few singular ways that that must come about. And then that is what we uh, pursue. But in doing that, like I said, we eliminate uh, creativity or unlimited creativity and that thing coming about in any particular uh, way. And then the weight becomes on us as we have to make that thing personally uh, happen uh, ourselves. Uh, and when I say doing it uh, our particular selves is without our greater self, so to speak, without when we talk about uh, through the New Testament, uh, the word, without um, what it is that uh, at womb uh, is, uh, et cetera. So from that standpoint is a limited part of ourselves. Uh, we talked about, um, I think many years ago about the idea of uh, to, to pray for and uh, to actually just uh, uh, pray, uh, so to speak. And to pray for is to, uh, in a sense, acknowledge that you want something that doesn't exist. And it's as if you're constantly chasing that thing that does not exist versus you praying something is you, in a sense, experiencing that thing that you desire. And therefore, you uh, bring that thing already here uh, in your thoughts and beliefs. And it is uh, present uh, internally. And then it manifests itself uh, from a physical uh, standpoint. So for example, if there's a, right now I understand, I think it might've been uh, raining uh, recently uh, in, in the South Carolina area. And there's a lot of pollen and maybe the pollen uh, uh, may have been uh, needed uh, to, to, to provide balance. The difference in what I just explained is to have a desire of rain because the only thing that I see outside of myself is pollen, uh, dryness, everything is uh, yellow. Um, uh, all over the place. And it's just that I have a desire, really, really, really wanting uh, this rain uh, to come. Well, in doing that, I am acknowledged at, at the same time that I want this rain to come, I am also focused on acknowledging that there is no rain. There is not rain. Things are dry. Now, versus not shaping something and desiring it is just, and, and it's very fine, uh, different between the two, is only seeing rain not seeing uh, the pollen uh, within uh, my, when I say within myself, I mean in terms of what I'm experiencing about my environment that is without. I uh, notice uh, the moisture in the air. I feel the moisture in my air. I smell uh, that the smell, all country folk know, <laughs> when it uh, rains, smelling uh, the rain and the wetness in the air, the dampness of the uh, soil, uh, et cetera. Now with inside of me, in my being, this uh, dryness is not even a thing. So in a sense, I uh, felt, experienced all of this rain within, and then that comes about outwards in the physical uh, reality.
I got you. And and uh, I love something you 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 say. You you talked about uh, uh, let me see what this uh, uh, shaping is is in reality being doubt. Uh, I, I like that. I, I I was I was looking at this. I, I, I really think we're on to something, and that's that's why this is important to me, I guess. But as it is everybody, I know. But uh, I had something written down here that seeking peace is a path. It, it's, it's pointing you or it's, it's leading you to completeness. And completeness is where uh, I, I was looking at something with Job because uh, it talks about being perfect. And it talks about being consumed by something being in rhythm with the universe uh, and being uh, having right timing all the time. So you are ready to fully engage in whatever, when it happens, you are there. And, and uh, that, that, that kind of, kind of caught my attention uh, looking at that and, and understanding it. So I, I, I see this, uh, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, and I'm just trying to make sure I, I understand this because I think this is uh, kind of where we are as far as uh, all the things. That, the things seem to be happening so rapidly now. And uh, it, there are times, it, at least I do anyway, uh, feel overwhelmed and, and think, wow, what, what else, what's next kind of feeling. But uh, just looking at what you just said and, and looking at completeness, uh, I, I think we're on on the right path, and uh, I just I just try not to all the time uh, try to get a view of what I think things ought to look like or, or what what anything looks like. Uh, be being whole or being complete, all those things are are pointing at the same thing, and that's making space to receive, being one with the universe. So. I, I thank you for your explanation. No, no, and, and yeah. I, I, go ahead, Chef. I just want to say uh, one thing. I, I appreciate it, uh, sir, for you letting me to say this because I've been uh, biting my tongue as Ron was uh, talking. Something that I uh, he made me think of. I just had epiphany as he was talking. With that explanation that I uh, just gave, and off the heels of what Ron just said. When we talk about creating something on the inside, whatever it is that we desire, seek to see that thing in your environment and notice it. So, for example, if there is war uh, going on and uh, that the war you uh, want to stop and you, of course, uh, there is no war that stops war because war is destruction and tries to kill, destroy, etc the uh, only thing that can stop a uh, war in a sense is uh, uh, love and kindness and compassion. So in that particular sense, you wouldn't focus, or I, and this is to myself as well, on the war, you will focus or try to seek to find or see in uh, your environment, in your everyday life, uh, seek to, to see love, uh, compassion, um, et cetera, and that is a particular thing that now your, de your desire has turned to focus on. And now, in a sense, you have brought love and compassion or recognized love and compassion, focus on love and compassion, meditating on love and compassion within. And that is the thing that uh, changes the war in a sense. So it's to focus on the desire and not the lack of uh, that the lack or, or whatever that is missing that are you trying to fill the desire with. We internally have to switch our attention to the uh, to the object of the desire. You finish. Yeah, well, I, um, well, I, I thank you for that. I concur with it. I um, really wanted to speak to the, the idea of um, of our creating and um, what does it look like uh, to create? And what do we mean when we talk about uh, creating? How do we create this thing called space? 
that we talk so much about. Of course, it's significant that we do it, but how do we do it? Um, I think I mentioned this before, I'm not sure somebody did, that um, the idea of creating space is actually the excavation of all of those things that have beset us for so long. Um, the idea of the rituals of religion, the idea of our selfishness, the things that um, we have aspirations for that include that only includes us and our family of friends, um, ridding ourselves of those uh, thoughts and desires uh, is automatically creating the space to be filled with those things that we desire. And the things that we desire are, are those things that, that um, give us a greater sense and, and, and the greatest strength to embrace the reality that we are Elohim. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the most, the most efficient thing, the most important thing that we can ever create is space. And the, and the uh, best way to create space is to, um, to rid ourselves of all those things that we held so dear in terms of our thoughts and desires so that they can indeed be filled with the true desire uh, to, to uh, have the functionality of Elohim in the midst of humanity. Thank you. Hey, Pastor. Uh, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, and thank you, Ron. Um, one of the things that I'm coming to grips with as it relates to being a creator and being creative is that it's effortless. And the reason why I say it is effortless is in a comparative degree, when I elect not to create, that requires more effort. If I elect to create to destroy something or destroy what has been created, that requires a lot of effort. So I look at being a creator and being creative as effortless. And one of the things that I do to to create space and to take away space, be the minority in a conversation. It kind of tickles me to be a Republican around Europeans who are Republicans. You create space because they want to know why you're a Republican. Um, if someone is against capital punishment, I'll be for capital punishment or vice versa. Um, and then being a minority is, is not to disagree, yet it is to disagree, yet you have to present solid facts. If someone is against capital punishment, I will talk about capital punishment abroad and how effective it is, yet I would agree in the United States it's not effective. So I kind of take a great deal of pride in being the minority to create. Because if everyone is agreeing with one another, how creative is that without having someone to disagree? or vice versa. So I look at being a creator and I look at being creative, it's effortless. Um, George, 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 please. Uh, uh, George. Yes, sir. Would you, would, if somebody is right and you agree with them, that's the right thing to do. But if somebody is right and you're taking the opposite end of it, uh, what you're actually creating is chaos. You, you, what you act when you take the opposite. If, if I'm telling you that loving kindness is the thing that's going to bring balance to the earth, and you make a decision that you're going to challenge that, even though you know it's true, you're going to challenge it just for the sake of challenging it. Then what you are actually doing is creating chaos, and you are are actually prolonging the opportunity for balance to be experienced by mankind, which means that. At that point, you become a part of the problem as part as opposed to the solution of bringing balance to the earth. Uh, and um, uh, so it is imperative 
uh, that, that we understand that. Why? Because if we were going to do that, then when we we're on these phones every weekend, then so when someone is speaking to us and telling us what, what truth is and explaining what the scriptures are actually saying, and we challenge them just for the sake of challenging them, then what we are actually doing is taking away from those who really want to understand, and we are prolonging the opportunity for uh, humanity to become the entity that it was created to be. Does that make sense? Help me some Reb, it, 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 yeah. Reb, it makes it makes it makes complete sense to me, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. And everything you said is is plausible. Yet in inciting chaos, what if it jump starts something in you to speak upon it more fluently? And that's a plausible way to look at things. Is it inciting chaos? Of course it is. However, if you're, based on your example, Reverend Richard, you're telling me about love and kindness. If I am the one that just disagrees with that, just to disagree with it, maybe it helps you out. And maybe if I didn't say anything, maybe six people would get what you said. Yet if I am the chaos, and it is plausible, and if it's 12 people there, maybe you get 11 people. And that is a way to look at it. Um, nonetheless, but, but, Red, but George, George, the, the thing is, though, your intent. If you are confused by what he said or you, you sincerely do not agree with it based on your your own values and how you see things, then, yeah, you can bring about clarity because there are other people out there in the universe that have the same viewpoint. But if your intentions are to just bring about chaos, all you're doing is bringing chaos in the universe. It, that's your intent. So that, that has everything okay, to well, do with it. Well, Ron, what if my intent, based on the origin of my heart, it looks like chaos, I just want to press the olive. Well, first, uh, if yeah. you ask your question, then that's one thing. However, chaos does not bring order. Chaos destroys order. And that's why we are where we are now. The chaotic thought of our humanity has brought us to this place on the brink of destruction. And that's not bringing about order. What brings about order is when you recognize uh, the truth and, and embrace that truth uh, it, 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 and without, without, um, without trying uh, to increase the chaos in the earth. Questions is what bring about order and, uh, and understanding. If you don't understand something and you raise a question about it, that's the thing that brings um, uh, understanding to other people who are on that line who don't understand. But if you are, if you just challenge, just be challenging, now you're confusing them because they don't know where you are coming from in terms of your desire to bring peace to the earth because it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And keep in mind, like our whole, the creative thoughts that we're talking about, what's the source of them? You know, when we go back, we're talking about creating with an understanding where Elohim and that does take self discipline and awareness to to create from that standpoint. And we have to always, you know, be mindful of that because it still goes back to understanding who you are and, and then the source of that will allow you to cur- if you're creating based on who you are, you can't shape it from that point on. If if that's your source and that's your intent and motivation that's based on your identity, then you, you let it flow from there and the desire for love and kindness or peace. It it will happen based on who you are and you still you still can't shape it. So you, George was you were talking a little bit about shaping as well. So just keep in mind that it, it does take self discipline for us because I said this a couple of weeks ago, we all understand what we need to do when we understand who we are. The thing is, are you willing to be disciplined enough to do what's necessary um, at that point in time to, to get it done? And that, that's what we keep going back to, the the wisdom and understanding all those things that, that get you to the point of understanding who you are. 
and, and when he was talking, Joe, I, I, went, I went back and I was going back to that Galatians 5 and in the 25th verse. And I'm going to read what I wrote down that week, just as a process, and we can comment on it. It says, uh, those who walk in the Spirit have the privilege of God's own perspective on life's decisions. And that guides us through um, our process. The spiritual reception of that takes place through meditation and the influence is initiated then. And when that is initiated, then we quiet our minds and focus on truth. And then that guidance opens us up and we operate with discipline and the eighth sense. And that and that that's just something I, I think I wrote back and says day two on here. But it just you know, it speaks to the source and when we're walking in creating from the source of that and that's internal and with a clear understanding of who we are that our guidance is opened up because there's no, uh, there's no shaping that needs to take place. But if you found yourself um, praying for an event and you're trying to um, dictate how it should go, then obviously you're not operating from the source. You're, you're that's an external influence that you're trying to uh, shape time, how long, what, or where, and so just always remember that this, this creative process of bringing something to an existence is from within, and it's, it's from the discipline and the self-awareness of who you are and, and everything that's kind of funneled out or shaped from, I mean, it's sent out from that it's not shaped. It's just um, you're walking in that, that, that discipline and being able to check that and regulate that you're you're constantly validating it through your spirituality, your reception, and your meditation, and it, it all it's all integrated. If that makes sense. You can't if you look at the scriptures. You you don't bring the nowhere in the scripture where you find order brought the chaos by creating chaos because the creator is a creator of order and not that of disorder. So um, that would be antithetical uh, to the journey that we're on if um, we follow that pattern. Thank you. And and in that uh, order that you just uh, mentioned, that order uh, seeks to uh, uh, bring connectivity and bring uh, t together. So I wanted to speak on something that is uh, uh, very subtle that also happens as we speak about uh, creation and uh, how, I think it might've been Ron who mentioned and Pastor Richard, the intention of uh, those questions or disagreement if it is coming from a place of under, um, understanding uh, versus just trying to uh, be contrary uh, to challenge in a sense. That, uh, as I spoke earlier about the things that happen on the inside, that uh, what we do, we also uh, outwardly is also what we do uh, to ourselves internally. And we bring that into our lives and we uh, bring that into our uh, state of being. So for example, um, if I am uh, asking a question uh, to challenge uh, to bring greater understanding because I don't uh, particularly see it and don't agree with it uh, at uh, that particular time, that is me seeking to become uh, more whole and to gain uh, understanding. And that is what uh, all of us are actually uh, trying to do, at least say we're, you know, we're trying to do, um, is become whole, become uh, one, grow, et cetera. Now, uh, contrary to that, if I am actually just trying to bring uh, uh, chaos, that is coming from more so of a place of uh, destruction uh, or confusion. But in that, on a subtle level, I am doing the same thing within myself because I am focusing on tearing down and uh, discord, uh, et cetera. And so that I am bringing more so uh, in my being. So for uh, example, and uh, I don't know 
of anyone uh, uh, like this uh, that's uh, on, on this call right now. So I'm certainly not speaking about anyone on the call. I'm only simply trying to show uh, an example and I'm not judging from a, an objective standpoint uh, to uh, illustrate what it is that I'm talking about. A person who is typically uh, extremely uh, quote unquote messy and causes a lot of uh, confusion, uh, et cetera, and kind of gets stuck in that loop, uh, I can pretty much assure you that if you are uh, very close to that person's life or you know a lot about that person's life, that is essentially what their life is. Their life is uh, pretty much more so in shambles up and down. They're not uh, you know, very uh, rooted and grounded and their life itself uh, is messy. And uh, all of this is about learning these things that we're actually creating. But from them uh, being on that state of mind, focusing on that uh, state of mind on a regular basis, that is what they're creating uh, in, in their life. So going back to uh, you know what was said, intention is very uh, important. And then I also want to give an example of uh, love and compassion actually does create. Um, when you think about someone uh, who has a, a love for their gift or their uh, talent, whether that be uh, music, um, whether that be painting, um, gardening, whatever, that person actually uh, is extremely creative um, as it relates to having love and compassion uh, with or for uh, other individuals, whether it be uh, um, a, a child, uh, a parent, um, uh, actual uh, lover, whatever. Also, again, the things that a person uh, does that even may have come to themselves as being completely unimaginable at uh, one point, it comes from uh, creativity and just expressing uh, love and is an act of uh, love. So the idea that uh, uh, creativity can only come from uh, chaos is uh, absolutely not uh, true. And uh, th the last thing I wanted to say is the idea of instead of, uh, or we don't have to look at things as being uh, one or uh, the other. There's always a looking at things from the standpoint of and, and uh, building upon uh, things as well, as long as those things come uh, or, or are back or have their origin in love, going back to that uh, that verse that uh, Audrey mentioned um, earlier today uh, from uh, First uh, Corinthians, I think first yeah First Corinthians fifteen and thirty three. I'm done. Uh, she got. I mean, drop. I mean, a great point there and. I can remember thinking earlier this week too, you know, you, you think about um, creating and, um, you know, parents on this call as well. Um, probably your ultimate creation <laughs> is, um, you know, bringing life in, in this earth. And, and when you try to raise kids and, you know, develop them, and we were all raised by someone as well, when you look at it from that standpoint and, and not so much of a you know, physical creation either, but when you look at it from a standpoint of raising a child, and, and that, is, that is a form of creation there where you're conceptually trying to give them a philosophy, but then you're also um, trying to give them something to stand on. I heard it when the guy said this this week that, you know, like he didn't want his kids walking in his shoes, that he had uh, created a life for them by his sacrifice and the people before them that sacrifice. And he doesn't look at um, his kids walking in the shoes. You know, he says, this, we want the kids now to kind of stand on our shoulders, meaning that put them in a position where they can build on what you struggle to create for them. Um, that experience that you've gone through and you've developed 
You don't want them walking behind you and, and then having to do the exact same thing as you did. You want them standing on your shoulder so that they are elevated. And I think mean, pastors say this all the time, like our kids aren't going through the religious and church experience that we went through. So that's, to me, I look at that sort of creating of life and then allowing that to grow so that they can stand on our shoulders and, and I say all that say this creating takes it takes a certain amount of vision, but you can only envision what you would like your kids to be, you know, successful or whatever. But really now that was a vision that I thought I wanted, but really now I just want them to know themselves and understand who they are and operate under that notion. And I'm at peace with whatever they do, whatever, you know, as long as they understand who they are. But you have parents that have um, created this life and they want to shape that as well. So when you were talking, I was thinking about the ultimate, the ultimate shaping as far as being parents <laughs> and trying to control uh, how our kids will go through life and what they will become. But all now, I really want to say, yeah, stand on my shoulder and, and be aware of who you are. Try to understand how to be functional and not dysfunction and, and understand who you are and build on that. So, yeah, so in that regard, stand on, stand on our shoulders because a lot of things were created in the long-term intentions. We don't know when the first bag phone came out. I don't know if they understood that phones would be to uh, to us what computers were back then when phones were created. I don't know if they had that total vision, but they had a vision of, you know, given mass communication and, and things. So things, I say all that to say things evolve and we stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us. Even though you think you have a vision, at some point you realize that there just has to be an awareness of who you are and then you can't uh, force things or shape them or try to influence them to, because all you're doing then is keeping things in a box. And so you can't, you know, you can't keep things in a box. You just have to create and allow that creation to kind of stand on the shoulder. And if things are evolving from it, things get better from it. Um, and if as long as it was done, with the intent of just, you know, without any kind of um, ill thoughts. If we are creating from being Elohim, now we understand that. Then allow things, create as Elohim and allow things to kind of stand on your shoulders. So that's, that's all I have to say for anyone to kind of follow up on that. And, and this, Barbara, um, just, I, I appreciate what you just said. Um, uh, yeah, some of us have wanted our children to follow this path or that path or whatever, this this profession or that profession. Um, but in the end, um, uh, loving them is letting them be who they are. That that's what that's what true love is, letting them be who they are. Uh, the other thing I wanted to speak to is the fact that uh, um, I think it was Sheldon uh, said something about. Um, when he was talking about um, space and creation, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to um, gather my thought as I, as I talk, uh, the thought of what he said. Um, when, when we try to shape something, when we ask for something, oh, it was the thing he said about doubt. You know, when we try to shape it, we doubt it. Um, and, and that's because, um, when we open ourselves up to the wisdom of the universe and we ask for loving kindness as it relates to receiving from the universe. Uh, and, and we may be targeting Ukraine <laughs> or we may be targeting our family only, that, that sort of shaping it. But when we ask for love, peace and loving kindness and balance in general, not only does that feel that need as it relates to family or the Ukraine, but even those needs that we that are not in our conscious thoughts, 
when we trust the universe to provide peace and harmony and balance. It does it. Uh, even in places or locations or people that we don't even know. And that's the, because of the connectedness of us all. So uh, by shaping it, we can limit it. And we don't want to limit it. We want everyone, everything to have that same access. And we're simply the conduit, which means then that the loving kindness, the peace, the harmony flows where it needs to go, uh, rather than our saying, uh, uh, oh, give peace to Ukraine. It's bigger than that. The universe is bigger than that. Our connections are bigger than that. And so we have to trust that uh, instead of uh, uh, trying to shape it because that shaping does, in, 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 a, in a sense, uh, create the doubt that we don't trust the universe uh, to do what's required or what's necessary for everybody who is also part of the universe. Thank you. You know, Barbara, as you were saying that, you were saying that too, and I was like, man, that's uh, <laughs> it was like religion has been shaping us. <laughs> and, you know, it tells you how to worship, um, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, this is how you should, you know, respond or act. Same with all, of, you know, like, as you were saying, I thought about all the, the missionary trips, you know, um, We'll go over and help you, but we want you to establish a church, and this is what our church says. We want you to establish a church, and this is what Jesus looks like. Put this up. We're going to, instead of uh, just being what they profess to be, it always comes with a uh, shaping. It's really selfish because it comes with a, a charge, and it requires you to to do something for something. And that's not where, what we're supposed to be uh, about. And so when we shape and things, we're also trying to get something out of it because we did something. And so I'll, when you were speaking, I was just like, you know, that that's uh, another aspect of looking at trying to shape something is really um, in a, sort of an act of selfishness. And... Um, and we, we see it in religion all the time. It's like um, you're shaped by, by your ties and all you're shaped by your auxiliary. You're shaped by what you um, wear, wear a suit to church on Sunday, Sunday best. And some of those things have evolved in the church, you know, recently. But, but religion has, has put a, a huge uh, bowl or structure around the lives of people that, that go in and out of it. And then when they do missionary work, it's, um, uh, it's great on the surface, but is it really missionary work? And so I appreciate what you just said, but I was, I was just thinking about that as you're going to that, man, this is sort of a, this is a, a selfish way shaping things. It's sort of a selfish act because you're trying to dictate who it benefits and who, you know, who it serves. And so we can't do that as well. So when we try to, shape things, we're also trying to control who's affected by it. And we just need to let it go and let the universe work it out and have that desire for this. And that desire comes from based on who we are, clear understanding who we are, and just let it go. But when we try to dictate who benefits and who is actually uh, involved, it's sort of selfish when we do that. And I, I, just, I was just thinking about that when you were talking. So. I didn't know someone else was there. cutting someone off when I first uh, mentioned that. Well, yeah. not only this is selfishness, uh, but um, it also uh, speaks to the uh, idea of our not wanting uh, to actually leave those things behind that have been uh, uh, adversarial to what we say we desire. It, it, it's like when when people say that um, 
I'm being the devil's advocate. Um, that sounds kind of that sounds you know one way on the surface, but when you think about what they're saying, they're saying that I am advocating uh, for the adversary. I'm advocating for everything that's adversarial to what you're talking about. So that in itself speaks to the idea of um, staying planted uh, on a course of not only selfishness, but maintaining the order of things as they are and knowing that they are not beneficial to humanity. Thank you. No, I appreciate it too. Yeah, because there's one thing to keep in mind when we're on this, this walk and this, uh, this, this awareness of ourselves. That's going back to what we talk, preached or talked about earlier several uh, weeks ago. It's just, you know, when you're feeding yourself, but you're constantly in a state of, of, of awareness of just being, we watch for signs, we listen to things that we, um, that we know that, you know, we, we see as a, an adversary to it, and, and these things come to you a lot easier. They're a lot more clear when we're when we're locked in and, and totally understanding of who we are. I mean, and so we we don't miss as many signs as we talked about before. Like you don't you don't miss those signs when they're coming at you. There's a, there's a lot more clarity there. You may not be able to see the results right then and there, but you know. In your gut, that feeling that okay, yeah, this is right, and you don't miss those signs, and so that, that's part of the process too of, of accepting and going. That is that you don't lose that awareness of um, how you should handle things, and, and it's a lot clearer on what you should do and what you shouldn't do, and you, so um, and all those things just kind of they come together with that growth and that discipline that we have to constantly walk in day in and day out and in, in, in that functional being Elohim, function of Elohim, it slowly starts to decrease the dysfunction that um, that you come across and things in your environment become a little more orderly too based on who you are and who you and how you understand and how you function of that. As you continue to function, it, the environment around you begins to become less um, dysfunctional because um, the mere presence and desire of walking and talking of who you are it, it takes away some of the some of that chaos that may be going on around you, and it, it always helps you to rise above it. And when you're above it, you can actually have a clearer picture of what's going on. But when you're not functioning and aware of who you are and you're in the midst of it, you know, you have to fight your way out of that dysfunction and that's where we help each other. Because if um, someone is, you know, higher above it, they can see more function and that's why there's always that need for us to communicate in the connection with each other because it does pull us out of that chaos a lot of times where you may be a little more in the midst of it. You can have someone who's, um, you know, further away from it, continue to help us, you know, pull each other out of it versus if you're in the chaos and you're only communicating with the people that are right there, it, it, it's a harder, it's a harder thing to get out of. And so that goes back to why we need each other, why we need to communicate and share and not be judgmental at that point because we're just, it's just constantly trying to lift someone up high enough so that they can um, think clearly and have a little more time. You're creating that opportunity for them to become more self-aware too. So I, I just wanted to say that. And any other questions or comments on that today? Yes, this is Angela. I have a, um, a comment more for what I wanted to say. We were talking about um, shaping, you know, shaping things into the way that we want it to be. And looking at, um, not well, mainly Christianity. Christianity, they don't, they teach you to bond more with people that's just like, well, I ain't going to say people just like, at one, one time I looked at 
sinners as being separate from us when we're all the same. But it's a continual of Christianity or teaching that we're separate from one another when we're not separate from one another. So instead of teaching that we're separate and it, it's more bonding that goes on in the church, um, I know, you know what I mean? if, yeah, if there's more bonding that is going on, then you're putting more love out into the, of the universe, but it, it's the opposite. The people thinking that we're separate, we're not, we're not separate. We're, we're all, we come from the same source, the same same creator. So I hope I'm not, I mean, I know what I want to say. I'm afraid that I'm getting it out the way that it needs to be, but I just wanted to say that. No, I appreciate it. And, and even, like I said, even uh, people who don't have a total understanding, and, and we'll probably touch on this a lot more uh, tomorrow. Um, but I mentioned earlier, uh, people don't uh, really understand things. And they've tried to go, mankind's always been looking for this clarity. In, in certain regards, and certain people try different things, and and I thought about, uh, and I'll give you this example for the day, and you can you can think about it. Uh, but everybody has been seeing the public life of uh, we're all old enough to see Mike Tyson and all the dysfunction that he went through, and you know he was at a point in life where I think he had lost uh, most everything material to him. And uh, and even a guy like that who acknowledged that he had some mental health issues, he had some self-discipline issues, not physically, but just because he said he was always physically disciplined as a fighter. It was when his mind started really just unraveling the way he just lost his, he said, his spiritual discipline. And I look at somebody like that who uh, went on a journey, I think it was Australia somewhere, and smoked this this fungus that and basically it, it took him on a he said it took him on a spiritual journey that that lasted I don't know how many hours a day but he went there to find himself and so he now he says when he's and he's back now that that's created a second chapter in his life where he totally looks at things differently and how he's connected with humanity and how he's just uh, become a changed person because he said he, he stripped away all the things that uh, he struggled with mentally and he got the clarity and he got the support that he they needed. So just in, and we'll touch on it later, but just in, in comparison to that journey of how he now, is, he looks like he's just um, still doing some of the things he wants to do, but he's just so much more at peace now. And, um, He's not, in his own words, he's not destructive anymore. But it's, uh, it just goes to show you, illustrative. just want to bring it up, that we all have on our journey. And that's why I go go back to the meditation. And, and um, we have to lift that chaos away from us. Everyone's in search of it at some point in their life. There's just a, there's just a pull for us to go back to the beginning. And everybody's journey to get there. There's so much that we have to remove or or block out mentally and spiritually that um, that even someone who's not necessarily studying what we're studying, he he sought a way or a means to try and get to that place of. Um, of his true identity and, and trying to function at that so he can be with peace at it. But I just just wanted to touch on that just for a little bit about tomorrow because I was looking at that this week a lot and how visions and memory and dreams and how these things, um, we search for it, we search for explanations to bring clarity to us. And that was the one word that I was um, the kind of gravitate to this week, you know, bringing clarity to it. So that's, that's kind of where we want to head in it. But in, any other questions or comments on it? Hey, it's Ron. Um, can I share a dream I had the other night with y'all? Yes. Don't mind. 
No, go ahead. Um, sure. It, it, it's, it's, it's totally selfish, and, and uh, but it has a lot to do with shaping. Um, I, it, it, you know, what, what I think brought it on is I look at my fate in life and my age and how my body feels, and, and those things just come together a lot. And it, it kind of gets to a point sometimes it, it, it catches me, you know, and, and I look at things and think, wow, okay, but what direction do you need to go in? What do you need to do different? So my shaping things that I know what I desire, I know what, you know, it, it, how to get out of this and this is my life, but I don't always know what the path to take. So. The other night, this was Thursday night, I had a dream. And uh, in the dream, I was on this bus, and it was a really, really fancy bus. And the bus was full of celebrities. The one that kind of hosted all was Oprah. Oprah was there, and I saw Tyler Perry, and I saw all these people leaving faces that I didn't know names. And I look around on this bus, and everybody was paying attention to me and asking me questions. And, and, I'm, and I'm, the whole time I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I on this bus? You know, I'm not driving it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here with them. And I'm looking at how all these people are dressing. And they stop and we go to this club or we go here, we go there. They took me to dinner. Uh, we, we were sampling wines. We, they took me everywhere. And at the end of the evening, uh, we come to this parking lot, and all these people are standing around, even some of the people that weren't on the bus. And this guy steps forward, and he says, look at all these cars. He said, everybody in here donated a car to you. All you got to do is pick one. Which one do you want? And I looked around, and there, every kind of car you can imagine or uh, antique cars, just beautiful sports cars. And I'm looking at these things, and, and, and it was slightly enticing just because they were shiny and pretty. But I looked in the back, and in the back was a 2015 Toyota Highlander that my sister had given me. And... I pointed to it and I said, I'll take that one. And the guy said, wait a minute, why? Why do you want that one? What? What is it? That's your car. You already got that. That's, that's what you already have. And I said, yeah, I said, I trust that the creator has me on a journey. That car is a part of that experience. Other cars. I'll no longer be in that experience, and I'll never know how I end or what I pray for ends. And everybody looked at each other, and I started walking to my car. When I started walking to the car, I woke up. So later that morning, I'm sitting in the car at work. I sit there and kind of collect myself, breathe a little bit before I get out. And this little voice said to me, I want you to know that you made the decision. You made the decision to stay on this journey. And I thought about it. Without hesitation, I made the decision in my dream. And I was a little amazed by that because that's everything I prayed for, all the stuff I think I, I you know, I, I thought I needed to get me out of this. But like I said, it, it has everything to do with shaping. I chose to stay here. And then I thought about it. I, I thought about even when I got there that day, uh, my manager sent me to a job that wasn't mine. It was somebody else's. And I thought about all the things that people in that place do to look out for me. Every job I've had this week, I've done the easiest thing in there. Uh, and then later in the afternoon, something happened and we had to get some, some stuff out and I, and I went to work. But I left there yesterday and I was tired. My back was hurting because 
I, you know, at the end of the day, we have some stuff to do. But it, it, it just thought about it, but it just, it was a different place. The same discomfort, the same fatigue, but a different place. So the shaping thing, you know, I heard what, what Barbara said really, really, really took, took root with me because that, that came to me too. Your, your prayer uh, for comfort uh, is, is not always what you need, nor should you try to shape that. And it's, you know, echo what S and, 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 and uh, uh, Sheldon said, the, the selfishness of that. So I, you know, I, 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 uh, that happened to me. I'm going to write it down. In fact, I started writing it down, but uh, it just kind of fit to me in my world, I guess, what we, what we were talking about today. And again, I, I, I appreciate you guys for allowing me to share that. Uh, one of the things I want to add based upon what Ron said just about dreams as a suggestion, take advantage of your dreams because in your dream, you can be whatever you want to be and it's free. And with me personally, when I'm driving, I'm at work. I dream about having my own counseling practice and I put myself in positions where I ask myself questions and I answer these questions and I'm entrenched with that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And when I sleep between Saturday and Sunday, I fall off into a deep sleep because the other parts of the week, I don't sleep. I don't rest. I got four alarm clocks to make sure I wake up. And the things that I've put in me, I dream about having that counseling practice. Um, so take advantage of your dreams. A dream is free. That's why everybody do them. Yet the part of the dream of, okay, the time going to do itself, I just got to show up when I want to show up. So dreams are just a suggestion to you. Whatever you think about a great deal, you will have it in the dream. Um, the thing about the counseling practice, I dream about it so much. Yet when I put it in reality, okay, George, what are you going to do to, you got to find a building. Okay, look at a couple of buildings. Um, so just take advantage of your dreams. Um, it's there for a reason. So I, that's just a suggestion. And I thought I was like the only one that had them dreams. So it was good to hear Ron talk about it. Um, that's it. On, on, on the heels of that, guys, there's one other part of it I want to say that was very important. When, when those parts came in, it was probably about one third, a quarter to two. And she says to me, Ron, do as many of these as you can, else you're gonna have to come in Saturday. And I say it, I am not coming Saturday. And I said, I don't mean to, I hope that didn't come out wrong, but I won't be here Saturday. I have something else that I do on Saturdays. I said, it doesn't mean I won't work a Saturday, but this Saturday I won't be here. She goes out and gets four other people to work on that project so that it could be complete. And I thought, wow, I, I really appreciate the way people go out of their way to do things for me. And there are times I don't see that because of that selfishness because of my vision isn't always clear. But I saw it yesterday and I saw it clearly and that, that made a difference to me. So it, it just kind of echoed home when everybody was talking. So thank you. No, I appreciate it. And uh, that's one of the things that, you know, want to dive into a little more just the uh, dreams, your inner vision and, and clarity and uh 
you know, tying it back into you talk about the memory um, and, and this um, keep moving forward in, in the sense of, okay, how do we do things or how to, um, and just um, just understanding that um, those things give us the, because we talk about, we talk about meditating and, and the benefits of it, but, and then the, the reality of the dreams and the visions and the memories is like, these things designed to give us a, inner clarity that we uh, we talk about, you know, see things clearly. So hopefully we can kind of you know, pull that together tomorrow too as well and start touching on that. But, uh, any other questions or comments today? I have a question. Um, I just wonder if Pastor had any ideas about um, the fact that Easter, Ramadan, and Passover are converging all this month. Anyway, but he can answer last if, if there are other questions about the topic. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I do. I, I believe that this is a golden opportunity for us in that the energies of what's considered the three major uh, religions are converging. And because of our desire and our sincerity uh, for balance and for change, for humanity to become what it was created to be, and that is human, that we have an opportunity now to filter all of these things that separate us from these three major religions, leaving uh, within the confines of them the spiritual nature that each one of them purports to have. What do I mean by that is an opportunity to be a strainer through which all of the uh, rituals and the um, politics of these religions uh, begin to be exposed so that they can um, be filtered out of the lives of men. The violence in all three of them, the violence of Christianity that we see taking shape around the world in these quote-unquote Christian na uh, nations, the Islamic violence that is uh, blamed on Muhammad, uh, the Jewish violence that's blamed on Jesus. All of these uh, uh, opportunities, I'm sorry, and all of these religions rather, have granted, has granted us an opportunity to bring peace to the earth. And tomorrow is, to, um, between yesterday until tomorrow is an opportune time for us to deal with it. Why? Because of Islam and Judaism being uh, focusing on Ramadan Friday and, and um, Passover beginning on Friday, entering into the, and sat, to Saturday, and Christianity looking at the uh, false religion of Easter from the fourth holiday of Easter and the resurrection uh, being early in the morning. All of these things we take into account for the mere purpose of exposing the, the lies ingrained in them and the um, and, and showing others how they have nothing to do with uh, the Quran, the Old Testament, New Testament, no holy book whatsoever. Uh, um, that's about it. I, um, I, I, I say this because um, I don't remember ever, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I don't remember all of these three days being, uh, these three celebrations being at the same time. Now that they are, we recognize it. Is there for a reason? I, I visited a place last night. And some of you have heard me say that um, the people who I've been very close to just die all around me. Last night, I saw, I was in the midst of everyone who has died. I mean, I literally saw their faces. I felt their presence. Um, my cousins, my grandmama, my, my mentor, all of the people, all of them were right there in this place. 
And all of them were there, and I did not understand why I was in the midst of all of these people who were so close to me who had died, and my heart broken because of it. But at that point, uh, it was no longer broken. A healing took place. And I see that now in conjunction with the question that Audrey raised. It is time for a healing to take place. All of these religions have broken the hearts of men around the world. They have destroyed communities and cultures. They have destroyed the trust in our creator. They have destroyed everything that's meaningful to us. So let us take this opportunity to shift our focus from such a, uh, from just a desire for change openly to a desire to open the eye of all of those who have embraced uh, these, these religions blindly so that they can truly see that the brokenheartedness that all of these religions has brought, the division that they have created has now ended. And is, we have opportunity to be one again. Thank you. Audrey, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? And one thing I'll say fast is like just the whole, uh, I said earlier that, you know, this, there's a search going on, a desire going on for people that, you know, whether they're on the right path or whatever, it's not really, um, but there's a, there's, there's definitely, some, you know, some change going on, and there's a search for awareness going on. And I, and I don't want to, you know, prolong the call, but just to, on the heels of what everybody said, I experienced something yesterday that was small and minimal, but I didn't really think a big deal about it. Just, but I thought it was kind of unique yesterday. We'll, we were trying to get a tire repaired and, and didn't know if it was going to be the tire or they could just patch it or whatever. And so um, the discount tires, they, they'll do a patch for free or, you know, very minimal charge if uh, if that's what it is. But uh wanted to get it uh, repaired yesterday just because, you know, the weekend, um, things get a little more harder and it's not shipping if they didn't have to get the tire. Anyway, I kept calling the discount tires. It's about lunchtime. And you know what the message said? They didn't say they were closed for a good Friday. It just said that they were going to be closed from 12 to 3 so that their employees could observe it and the call back after 3. So they literally shut down from 12 to 3 yesterday, and which was good because it went at 4 o'clock and got the tire done. But that voicemail just kind of uh, told me that, you know, there's something going on for a company like that to say, hey, you know, and observe it so that our employees can observe the kids Friday that we're going to be close from 12 to 3. I, I just thought that was kind of unique and something I hadn't really seen or expected before. And I, I just wanted to say that there is, there is a shift going on, of course, and there's, you know, uh, we kind of have to embrace it and more importantly also be receptive and dealing with people from where they are right now and, and just um, being a part of the solution and and just uh, everyone keep your ears and eyes open for the smaller signs, things that you should listen for and when people are sharing. I just wanted to put that out there. But any other questions or comments before we uh, close it down? If not, we'll, uh, we'll pick up tomorrow. And I hope everyone has a a good day and uh, be safe and careful out there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, S. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.